any app that you use to purchase books or any library and pick any one of them. They're all wonderful. And begin reading the things he has to tell you through his books and start by listening this afternoon with your heart and your head and even more with your spirit open. Welcome, Shane. Well, I hope it's been as good of a day for you as it has been for me. How you feeling? All right, it's all right. A little lunch slag there I got. But uh, I also, not only is Suzanne my wonderful host, but she also made that lentil soup, which was awesome. And I know there are a lot of other people that cooked and made stuff too, but the fact that she made that soup and is hosting me and running me around, it's just incredible. So I'm grateful for the whole family here welcoming me in. I've... uh, Speaking of see, living simply, we, I tried to start staying in homes instead of hotels when I can. Uh, we estimate that we've saved about $20,000 a year doing that. But uh, I, everybody always thinks it's real sacrificial. And I'm like, yeah, right. When you stay in people's homes, you get spoiled, you know. And so that, it's really more life-giving for me. Um, so this, this afternoon uh, is a little different feel. We're in here having lunch, and it's going to be a little bit more conversational. We're going to open it up in a bit. I, uh, uh, the theme that we've been talking about, uh, the overall theme is living simply in a complex world, but this particular reflection uh, it was sparked by Dr. King, uh, who someone threw the insult at him that he was maladjusted, and you may know this story, and what was meant as an insult, he took as a compliment. <laughs> And he, he, uh, reflecting on that, said, uh, well, we do live in a world that has become way too adjusted to racism, way too adjusted to injustice, uh, way too adjusted to poverty and the inequity between the rich and the poor. So Dr. King said, we need some holy maladjusted people in the world. And uh, so, you know, as you read the scripture, you get the sense that we are being invited uh, to live into a different story, story, right? To embrace different values than the culture around us. And in fact, uh, when, you re- when you read the gospel, uh, that wonderful image uh, of, of your own, you know, Don, Don Crabill, right? The, the, the upside down kingdom. Uh, you read Luke and it says the last shall be first, the first shall be last. And then it says the mighty will be cast from their thrones, right? The lowly will be lifted up, the hungry will be filled, and the rich will be sent around uh, away empty. I always tell people that is not Karl Marx. <laughs> that is the Gospel of Luke and the Psalm, uh, Song of Mary. And it's that upside down kingdom that we're kind of dreaming about a little bit. How do we orient ourselves around uh, a different kingdom, a different story. And to get us going, you know, coming out of lunch, I thought I'm going to show a few images, but I also have a video clip because I was traveling around the country talking to a lot of young people, and I am convinced that we are losing a lot of young people in the church, not because we've made the gospel too hard, but because we've made the gospel too easy. Right? We've, we've reduced this to... Um, a statement of beliefs and young people really want a revolution, right? They're very aware that the world that, that they've been handed is uh, really messed up, right? And, and if our faith doesn't engage the brokenness of this world, then uh, they sort of lose interest. And I think the good news uh, that we talked about this morning is that uh, the reign of God, the dream of God, the kingdom of God is not just for something, you know, for when we die, but something we're to usher in while we live. So this young person uh, who's a little older now, uh, I met on the road and just had a really fun story. And, you know, it's one of those moments where I was like, man, I wish we had a camera. And I remember we got a documentary crew with us. I was like, yo, get over here, you know. So they got Mark Weaver's story. It's going to pop up here on the screen. So just watch this for fun and think about what it means to be maladjusted. I was in California 
I started reading The Irresistible Revolution by Shane Claiborne. So much my brother Rick, he sent me a copy of the book. And as I was reading it, I was totally inspired and I was feeling convicted inside living in one of the richest communities in America, in Orange County, California. And I was part of these mega churches. I wasn't living as selfless as I could be. And would you really give all your possessions away, sell them to the poor and follow me? And I was challenged and convicted. Would I really do something like that? But I kind of shrugged it off. I was like, well, I really don't even have any possessions. But the next day, some of my friends came to visit me from Indiana and California and they wanted to go get on the show The Price is Right. Here it comes from the Bob Parker studio at CBS in Hollywood. We got in line and they actually called my name up. And Mark Weaver, come on down. The actual retail price is $14.49. Mark, you're a winner. Mark, you're a winner. 60, Bob. He's going to try 60. We're looking for the back of the car, and there it is. $17,260. I'll shake the hand of a winner. You have to beat 85 cents to get into the showcase, and you did it. You will be in the showcase at the end of the show. With his new range. In romantic Paris. Of her brand new convertible! Six thousand one ninety-two. Mark is the winner. I ended up winning the whole showcase showdown on the prices right. I won almost sixty thousand dollars in prizes. I won two cars, a trip for two to Paris, a stove and a rug. It was really cool. But then I remembered the words that Shane wrote in his book, so I decided to sell the two cars that I won on the show right back to the dealership. And I used the money to fly to Uganda, Africa, and I just decided to live in an orphanages for a while and just give all the money I weigh to them. The orphanage Mark lived in is for children who lost their parents to AIDS. For each one of these beautiful children here, two people died from the AIDS epidemic. Nothing ever felt better than to just give away the money rather than to keep it and get something for myself. I've never been without a meal. I've never been without a shirt on my back. Stuff like that is the least I could do. And if everybody gave a little bit like that, I think this world would be a better place. We'll be right back. So it's pretty fun, huh? Uh, I'm, I'm excited to say that uh, I've done my best to keep in touch with Mark. And last time I talked to him, he, he hadn't left the church. In fact, he was a pastor and he was a youth pastor. Uh, I think working back in Southern California where he came from. So I think there's that, you know, kind of longing in all of us to see the church be more faithful and to live into the countercultural values of Jesus. And I, I often think that the, the gospel spreads best, not by force, but by fascination, right? By folks that are loving Jesus and living out their theology uh, on the streets in the real world. As Mother Teresa said, our best sermon is our life. And, and, and to think through, like, how do we live out the values? And I think our big challenge in the church is not just right believing, but right living, right fleshing it out. And so for the afternoon conversation, I thought uh, the, one of the best uses of our time is just to stir up our imaginations together and in order to do that, I, want, I brought some pictures, and I don't want this to feel prescriptive, like what we're doing is what you need to do, but I want it to be more provocative, you know, that we can kind of uh, dream together and imagine together. So, but I did bring this, and, and I don't think of this as like a PowerPoint as much as like my family photo album. We just made it big enough for you to see it up here, okay? So 
if you've not been to our community in, in Philly, this is what happened for us, is uh, in 1995, there was a group of homeless families who were living in an abandoned cathedral. The, there were 3,000 families on the waiting list for housing. Uh, and, and then and now, the average age, let me just do a little poll. I do this with, with you sometimes. What is the average age of a homeless person in the United States? Do you know that? Throw, throw me out some guesses as loud as you can. 35, 50, 20, 10. The average age of a homeless person is between 9 and 10 years old. But it's not often how we think of homelessness because um, it's, it's not necessarily who you see on the street corner downtown because folks are forced to kind of uh, be invisible or they're couch hopping, they're living in cars. They're, um, and if they're visible, then they can, you know, risk losing their children. So these families were on that waiting list for housing, and these were mostly mothers and children that began to get organized, and they moved into the abandoned cathedral, both as an act of survival and also a refusal to remain invisible, right? They wanted people to see that this is a problem in our city. And, uh, but it was also a very theologically provocative act because they moved into a an old Catholic building that had been abandoned for years, and it stirred all of the history of sanctuary, right? Of seeking refuge in the cathedral. Sadly, the archdiocese, uh, their response, the Catholic church told them that they were trespassing. This is the actual building they were in. Um, and if they weren't out within 48 hours, they could be arrested. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I was a student at Eastern at the time, and we heard that. And like good evangelicals, we said, we need to have a prayer meeting. And in that prayer meeting, it was crystal clear that God said to us, as we threw our hands up at God and we said, God, we need you to do something. We felt God say, I did do something. I made you. Get down there. You know, and we, we went down and found the cathedral that night. And on the front of it, they had hung a banner that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? And they were incredibly hospitable to us. They brought us into that struggle. And as some of you know, our community was born out of that. But they were also great organizers. So they held a press conference the next day and they said, uh, we mean no disrespect to the Catholic Church or the Archdiocese officials, uh, but we've talked to the real owner of this building. <laughs> and the Lord said, we can stay here. This is God's house. And so they stayed for me. <laughs> Many, many months, and all kinds of things happened. I've, you know, I've written a lot of those stories, but all that to say is that it was in that old abandoned church that we caught a fresh vision for church, right? That we began to read in the book of Acts about uh, how they shared everything in common and none of their possessions were their own. We began to uh, learn about the Catholic worker, worker movement, about the Anabaptist movements, right? All these community movements and... Um, and we, we started our community out of that. So just a couple other pictures here. Our, um, that's my wife and I got married there. So that's my lovely wife, Katie. And um, that's our neighborhood. We got permission to go back in. You know, we, we didn't want the archdiocese coming in and crashing our wedding party. So we, uh, we got permission to go back in. We got married in there. Some of the families and the kids that were just little uh, in 1995 were able to come to our wedding. And for some of them, it was the first time they'd been back in the church. So uh, that's a homemade tuxedo, by the way. I got my mom to thank for that. But, um, and this is, our, uh, this is our street. So I think it's important, you know, just to see the context that we're in. Uh, <laughs> our stretch limousine uh, after our wedding there. And this neighborhood is home, and uh, some of you may have come to visit us before, but we're on the north side of Philadelphia, a neighborhood called Kensington. And the reason I think place is important is because uh, when you read the gospel, a part of the whole story of Jesus is that God moves into the neighborhood, right? And God comes in real flesh, uh, and these towns that we read about, Sometimes you read the scripture and you get this sort of like romantic or fantastic view, but I've been to Capernaum. Any of y'all been to Capernaum? <laughs> it was a little town of 400 people, and you're like, wow, this is it, you know, and that's part of the point, right? Jesus came from a town called Nazareth, where people said nothing good could come, 
Like God showed up. And that's why when people call Kensington the Badlands, sometimes you know, Philadelphia folks or Pennsylvania folks call our neighborhood the Badlands. I'm like, be careful, because that's exactly what they said in Nazareth. Nothing good could come from there. And look where God showed up. But God, you know, so that, that's our home. That's our neighborhood. But, you know, it's also we spend a lot of time interpreting Scripture in seminary, use the word uh, uh, that we exegete Scripture, right? We're trying to read it in the context that it was written in. But I think, I think that's important. But I think it's also important to exegete our neighborhoods and to exegete our world. And by that, I mean we're asking the question, what does it look like, right, to live out the countercultural values of Jesus in our time and in our place? And that's what we've been asking for the last 25 years. And for us, this is some of what it looks like. And what I'm going to ask you a little bit, just a heads up, is that we're going to, we're going to ask the question, what does it look like here? You know, what does it look like where you're from? And, um, and, and so this is our neighborhood. We've got 30,000 abandoned houses. And if you, didn't, if, you, if you missed that, you know, we've got more abandoned housing than there are homeless people, right? At the same time, there's a... 3,000 families waiting for housing. We've got 30,000 abandoned houses. This is one of 700 abandoned factories in our neighborhood because it was an industrial town and, you know, all the jobs left. And, and so we've been, you know, surviving, rebuilding. But I always say, like, if you believe in resurrection, uh, Kensington's a, a great place to live because we're, we're, we're practicing resurrection we're reclaiming things bringing stuff back to life so you'll see some of those images but there is a lot of life in our neighborhood right so these pictures some of them were before the pandemic but one of the things that i've found is that neighborhoods that are economically poor are often community rich right and neighborhoods that are economically rich are often community poor because we don't know our neighbors. We, we don't always, um, we aren't stretched to kind of build a sense of community there. So community happens all the time in, in our neighborhood. It happens on the sidewalks. It happens in the street. Sometimes all we got to do is just pull out a grill and we can begin to create community. We have rhythms. You know, this is our, uh, our recovery community led by uh, Sister Margaret McKenna, who's a, she's 90 years old now. She's one of my mentors. She's on the chair right there. And, uh, and th- these are all folks that are recovering from drug and alcohol addictions. And it's also a reminder to me that I think the church has a lot to learn from the recovery community. And I'm sure there's many of us here that are in a part of rec- recovery communities of different, I mean, we're all recovering from something, right? But the idea that we're wounded healers is, I think, at the very heart of our faith. The, the fact that the things that we've survived are not our liabilities. They become our credentials. I know it's after lunch, but somebody can say amen to that, right? Like we're, we're, we are like, so the best folks to help women coming out of domestic violence are women that have survived domestic violence. The best folks to uh, help someone coming off heroin is someone that's got, you know, two years sober or nine years sober. So our recovery community is led by all, you know, folks in advanced recovery, except for Sister Margaret. She's kind of you know, she she's she's just she was actually a um, a um, she in the spirit of the desert. She moved in. She lived in the desert um, uh, as a, a as a Carmelite, you know, kind of sister. And then said, the contemporary desert is is you know our inner city. And she started living there and renovating abandoned houses. And before long, was living with fifty people. And she says, now nah, it's kind of like the the woman with a shoe that's got so many kids, she doesn't know what to do, you know, and they're all living together, and it, they've got multiple houses, so if you ever come to Philly, make sure you visit New Jerusalem, that's our, our recovery community, and um, a lot of what we do is, is probably similar to what you do, you know, we're, bu- we're building community by uh, creating rhythms and celebrations as a neighborhood, that's Mother's Day uh, on our block, and we've got like almost every month something that pulls our neighborhood together, this is our back-to-school party, um, where you can tell this before the pandemic, but every year we've started having like um, a big back to school bash. And uh, one year we had a two story water slide with liability insurance, and uh, it was incredible. And uh, th- this was one day that um, joy is important to us. And I think joy is part of what it means to be maladjusted in a world where they're trying to steal our joy every day. And um, so we told all, we did a press release and we told all the media. We're getting ready to set a world record in Kensington. And it's not, 
the most gun deaths or most heroin deaths or all the you know stuff that's usually in the news. We said, Josh Horton, good friend of mine, is the best juggler in the world, and he came to our block to set the world record. You ready for this? For the most apples sliced in one minute while juggling machetes. Boom! And he did it. So right after this, he set the world record. He's actually now setting the world record for setting the most world records, which is pretty cool. Uh, but, you know, so we, like, that life and that defiant joy is part of what we claim, right? And uh, I think it is part of the resistance. Is uh, I remember somebody talking about how the stock exchange was crashing at one point, and one of my neighbors said, well, no matter what happens on Wall Street, God is still good. And our hope doesn't lie in the stock exchange. Our hope is in Jesus. And then he said, and besides, my people have been in a recession for about 300 years. And God has never left us. So that, that's that resilient hope too. And it's that kind of hope that gives us um, the ability to believe that, can be, that, that things can be different, right? Faith is a substance of things hoped for but not seen. Or as my friend Jim Wallace says, uh, uh, it's believing despite the evidence and watching the evidence change. And I think we need some of that hope right now, right? That, that faith right now to believe that things can be different. So some of these images you'll see are about that kind of substantial faith. Um, this is an abandoned house, which we, uh, we get for one dollar sometimes. Uh, sometimes a little bit more. Five dollars. I just signed one lease that they gave us a house, and it was a seller concession, Don. I was like, what's a seller concession? They're like, oh, we thought that house is so bad, we're giving you money to take it. I was like, Cool, we'll take it, we'll take it. $30,000 seller concession. So we, we, but we're fixing them up, right? So now what we do, we've got a model um, where it's very similar. Millard Four that started Habitat for Humanity created a toolbox so we're, uh, that we can do ha affordable housing. So what we do is we uh, take an abandoned house, and our motto is we won't build a house for you, but we'll build a house with you. And the family does 350 hours on it. We finance it all. Uh, and we do a zero interest mortgage. So, and we sell all of our houses for $35,000. Some of y'all are ready to move in, I know. Um, uh, but we're also like have churches that sponsor houses. So if you want to do that, it'd be awesome. I mean, you can even sponsor a room. But we're fundraising that. And then we customize the house payment so a family can own a house for $400 a month. You know, And that's kind of what we're doing right now. So it's, it's a new nonprofit we started called Simple Homes. But I'll show you a few pictures because it gets me excited. So I, I like to think of this as part of how we practice resurrection, right? Taking an abandoned house. Not bad. You, you get a little bit more excited than that. There's your before and after. And then this is uh, one of our garden spaces that we reclaimed. And, um, and then uh, here, we, 10 years in, we had a terrible fire that burnt down one of our blocks. And this is what came out of it. We, I mean, we were devastated uh, originally, uh, I mean, right after, immediately after the fire. A um, hundred families were displaced. Our community center, my house, was all burnt down. Uh, thankfully, nobody was hurt. And our whole neighborhood pulled together. And we rebuilt it. So this was uh, right after the fire. And then this next one's what we've got now. In fact, we've got even more robust gardens now uh, after a few years there. And we've been reclaiming that space. And we call it uh, Phoenix Park because it came out of the ashes. These are a few of the murals that we painted. And we're just trying to uh, reclaim that space, right? And... and um, uh, one of those here, um, you learn as you go, and one of the lessons we learned on this one was that painting a mail container is a federal crime. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? But, uh, yeah, they were, they were nice to us, though. But anyway, that you can see the, uh, that one's more, mo one of our more theologically um, explicit, you know, murals, the lion, the lamb, the dove the rolled away stone, and the kids painted the bottom in pastels, and then we superimposed the green over it, so it's a really beautiful piece. And one of my neighbors said, um, every time I pass it, it's like a prayer on the wall. And she said, it reminds me of the stained glass window of, of churches, and she said, but this is our stained glass window. So that's, uh, it's kind of a proclamation that the stone will be rolled away, and we've seen way too many deaths uh, on that corner. So these are just a few images of 
food. But I, you know, I'm showing you all these just to say that I think part of what we've got to wrestle with is what it looks like to be the church, right? Not inside buildings, but in the world as Jesus was in the world. And to think about what does it look like to uh, be that kind of light in, in the communities that we find ourselves in. And a lot of that, you know, comes from the relationships we have. And uh, I mean, even in this, th- these pictures, like this is all work we did together. We built an aquaponic system where we got, we got a bunch of neighbors together and dug a hole where the fire was and <laughs> found like all kinds of things under the ground. And then we built this uh, greenhouse on top of it. So, you know, you can, you've got an integrated system where the fish are living off of the, the food and the food's living off the fish. And um, it's really awesome when it all works great like that. And sometimes it doesn't. But anyway, um, those are some of our fish and the food that we're able to share. So that's like homegrown kale and Swiss chard that we're sharing with neighbors. And now food distribution is a huge part of what this, what we do at The Simple Way. It's all led by neighbors that many of them have received food and now they're the givers of food and they've created a food pantry there. And we got home you know, homegrown food. And one of, the, one of my neighbors said years ago, he said, there's something wrong when it is easier to get a gun in our neighborhood than it is to get a salad. And I want my kids growing up where it's easier to get a salad than a gun. One of my other neighbors said, I think one of the best articulations of what we do, she said, uh, I get what we're doing. I get it. And I said, what? She said, we're trying to bring the Garden of Eden to North Philadelphia. N.T. Wright can't even say it that good, right? It is like, like the, some of the best theology I find comes from the folks that we're doing this work every, way, every day. You know, we're trying to ask the question, what does it look like for the kingdom of God to come on earth? Not just on earth, but on Potter Street, right? In Lancaster. What does it look like for God's dream to be realized? And this is the prayer on our front door, which is that God would heal all that is broken in our hearts in our streets, and in our world. As we think about what it means to be the people of God, I think we've got to uh, constantly keep together the fact that, that God is personal, salvation is personal, and salvation is also social. God is also healing uh, a broken world and a broken, uh, our broken streets. So in light of that, just a few images of what that's looked like for us. Like this was Uh, the land that the fire, the abandoned factory burnt down on, and we started to reclaim it. And uh, so this is uh, like about 10 10 years ago, and the city told us that they would never give us this land. So we just kind of kept praying over it, and we painted a mural that said, uh, Dear City of Philadelphia, it's been five years since the fire. Give us this land back so we can build a park. And then... uh, we just kept building momentum. You'll see in this sign, we changed the five to six years, and we, then seven years, then eight years. And then about 10 years in, the city has now donated that land, and we're collaborating with a wonderful group of folks, Esperanza Health Center, to build uh, a community center there for our neighborhood. So this is like all under construction. Now we're going to have a gym, and we're still going to have park space. We're going to have a healthy food and all kinds of things. And they have a medical clinic. Um, so... That's, that's uh, Phoenix Park. Now, this, let, the, the last few images I want to share, and then we're going to open it up, are, I think, part of our job, you know, as we think of what it means to be maladjusted, to be adjusting to Jesus in the world, is to think, what are the things that are obstacles to God's dream, to people flourishing? And in our neighborhood, I don't know what they are in yours, but in our neighborhood, one of those is the opioid addiction. And we have lost 1,200 lives to uh, opioids in one year. Uh, our children keep finding needles uh, on the sidewalk. In the, every time we weed the garden, we have to first go through the garden and check for needles. So uh, I knew how bad it was one day when the kids were having a snowball fight, and they said as they were gathering up snow, they were worried that under the snow, some of the needles could have gotten buried, and so they didn't want to hurt themselves as they're building a snowman. And that's where it happened for me. You know, there's just moments where you just got to snap. I was like, that is messed up, right? There is something wrong. And in the middle of that, we started praying and 
organizing. And we had a campaign prompted by the young people called Need a Little Help Over Here, right? And uh, we packaged up the needles, and we put them in epoxy, uh, and we put the names of all of our city officials on them with quotes from the kids. We delivered the needles to our mayor, to our health commissioner, to our city council people, uh, and we held a press conference and the children were the speakers, and our friends in recovery were the speakers, and we said, this is not okay, right? This is a public health crisis. Uh, the kids in our zip code are just as precious, just as much made in the image of God as the kids in any other zip code, and so we need this not to just be one more thing you talk about in city council. We need an emergency response, and we need it now, and within a few weeks there began to be an immediate response to that that leveraged funds and a and we still got work to do i don't there's not a dot on the end of this sentence but we we are still working on it but i'll tell you one of the city council folks said i left that jar of needles on my shelf to remind me of the urgency every day and that's what dr king said right when uh, that we've got to uh, make it uncomfortable we got to make it uncomfortable. we got to expose injustice so that it becomes so uncomfortable that people cannot remain silent, right? And I think that's part of what movement work is about, is to uh, stir people's hearts. So, uh, so much of what we do is, uh, it's our district attorney, Larry Krasner, getting his jar of needles there. And if they didn't show up, by the way, the kids just delivered them. <laughs> And they were going through the uh, the uh, security detector in, in, in City Hall. I was like, I'm not sure we can get the needles through that. The kids are like, yes, we can. Boom, they're already through, and I'm behind them there. And uh, anyway, that's uh, so I, I could not be um, more inspired than I am by the young people, not just in my neighborhood, but the young people that have stirred the movement for black lives, the March for Our Lives, the Parkland students, the folks that are young people that are working uh, for uh, environmental justice, the young people are rising up, right? And so I, I am proud to stand with them. And in light of that, one of the things that we've, we've done is we've also, like many of you, been thinking, how can the church be a prophetic countercultural witness when it comes to immigration? Because our country's in a crisis. And it's not just a crisis on the border. It's a crisis of compassion, right? That, that one of the holiest things that we can do is welcome immigrants and strangers. You know, it says welcome the stranger as if they were your own flesh and blood because you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt, right? God says we, that when we, entertain, when we welcome the foreigner, we might be entertaining angels unawares. That Jesus says when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. So the holy work that many of you are doing, welcoming uh, uh, refugees from Afghanistan or Ukraine or uh, Haiti, like this is holy work. And I love how this church, this is LaSalle Street Church in Chicago, they just put it on the wall, right? Of course we welcome refugees. We're Christians. <laughs> I like how matter of fact it is, right? And I think it's that kind of um, prophetic courage we need. Um, one of the things that we did just a few years ago was we gathered the dreams of dreamers, right? Uh, we had over 3,000 dreams from immigrant families and from young uh, immigrants, dreamers, and many of them were there, and they told their story, they spoke, and then we had clergy and faith leaders that you see here that delivered those dreams to our halls of Congress, and we read them out loud until we were arrested. Um, <laughs> and I'll never forget, there we are on our knees praying, and they came with a megaphone and said, you can't be here anymore, and we were taken into custody. And as we were being arrested, one of the officers said, thank you for your witness. They said, We're, many of us are with you in heart. I said, it would also be real nice if you didn't arrest us. But anyway, you know, I, uh, but it was, um, and of course those, you know, charges were dropped and whatnot. But um, yeah. Um, one of the other witnesses that we've done, uh, uh, some of you may have been a part of this, is, you know, we're kind of zooming out now as, as we think of our country. There's a lot of different issues, but one of the ones that has become personal for me uh, is the death penalty, and I've written a book on it, but more important than that, I've started visiting folks on death row, um, 
it started with writing letters. I always gave my books away to people who were incarcerated because it did, never made sense to me to try to sell them to people who were incarcerated. So I've always given my books away to folks that are locked up, and they write me letters over and over. And that's how a lot of my relationships started. And there's a lot of ways that you all you know, can write, write folks that are incarcerated, t- too, that we can talk about. You might already be doing that. But I will never forget one letter that I got was a young man who was facing execution. And it was just two bold words. And it said, please help. And over the years, I've gotten more and more involved with people that were wrongfully convicted and people who were correctly convicted. But who I hold out hope that we can do better than executing, uh, to, you know, to, to show that it's uh, wrong to kill. And so um, this is one of the witnesses that we do every few years at the Supreme Court. I'd love to have you come be a part of it. We, we actually do um, a fast and vigil at the Supreme Court uh, at the end of June every year, which is the same week as the week that the Supreme Court stopped executions in the 70s and then several years later allowed them to resume. And so we do a fast and vigil outside the Supreme Court. And every few years, this year was one of them, we um, do a direct action, a prayerful, nonviolent action where uh, we risk arrest. Um, some, some of us may not know, but even to hold a banner on the steps of the Supreme Court is illegal. Um, and so when you hold a banner like that, you are risking arrest. So we were arrested for that. Do you see how these stories go, you know? But um, this one was, there were a lot of folks that weren't arrested. In fact, there were people that were um, formerly on death row and, and, and incarcerated that were a part of this witness. Um, we held roses for uh, the victims of violence because we wanted to be clear that to be against the death penalty is not to be against justice or to say you know, that we, we, we don't care about uh, folks that, are, that have been victims of violence. But we carried roses, and we had many of them share their stories. And then we also carried roses for the, um, those that have been executed, and we held their names, uh, over 1,500 names of those who have been executed in the United States over the, uh, since in the modern era, since the res- the, they resumed in the 1970s. So... Um, and this, you know, many of the, much of this is personal as we think of those. Even this month, um, there are many executions being scheduled, and one of them is right after Easter in Tennessee, my home state. So you start to think we've missed the point, right? <laughs> in the Bible Belt, uh, it is the death belt. I mean, the executions are happening exactly where Christians are most concentrated and where Christians are in. Uh, governors and legislators is where the death penalty is held on. It's also the formerly Confederate states, right? The states that held on to slavery the longest are the same states that continue to execute. So we're praying for an end to that, and we're organizing for an end to that. And um, that's our um, uh, our witness that we do. And just so you, one of the folks that's in um, uh, under the umbrella there is Derek Jameson, who. He spent 20 years on death row for a, riot, a crime that he was innocent uh, of and had six execution dates. He's one of my really close friends. And um, after 20 years on death row, seeing 50 of his friends executed by the state, he, they forced the prosecution to release the full evidence. And they had over 30 pieces of evidence that proved his innocence. They knew he was innocent. And he was released from prison. And, um, so, and he went to jail and that witness saying, I want to end this thing and uh, uh, I mean gosh he's just a hero of mine so th- there's a, a lot of folks that are a part of that movement um, and if you want to follow our work on alternatives to the death penalty I can tell you how to do that it's just death penalty action um, but I, we, we need the full support especially of, of folks like you all that are part of a tradition of nonviolence. you know to really mobilize the whole denominations I'm convinced that we can be the generation to end the death penalty um, and that we will look back on the death penalty like we now look back at slavery, right? And with shame and horror and appalled that many Christians use the Bible to defend it. That's what we did with slavery and it's what's happening right now. But here's the good news is that when, it, when you ask millennial Christians, Christians born after 1980, 80% of them are against the death penalty. They can't make sense of how Christians can defend it, right? So part of this is our witness, right? Part of why young people are leaving the church is they see those contradictions, right? There was a poll done by Pew where they asked Americans, would Jesus be in favor of the death penalty? 
95% of Americans said, no, Jesus wouldn't be in favor of the death penalty. And they said, we just got to convince the, the Christians of that, right? Um, so this is, this is soul work. This is a spiritual crisis. And the last uh, little string of images here is around gun violence. And as you all probably know, uh, I mean, it's unprecedented anywhere else in the world, the lives that are being lost to guns. Uh, 41,000 lives last year. 562 lives in Philadelphia. The most homicides we've had in 30 years in the pandemic. And so we've began to, you know, have witnesses in the streets. We're doing a lot of work to try to mobilize around that. There's congregations like this one in Philadelphia that have put shirts out as a way of memorializing the lives lost, so as the name of the person who was killed and their age. So every time they come into worship, right? It's powerful that they are faced with um, this, this image reminding us that we have work to do, right? That, that, that this is, um, we're not just going in, the, the worship that we do in the church is uh, like the huddle before the football game, right? Like, but we got to get back in. We, and some people, it, it feels like a lot of the church is just having a huddle and never playing the game, right? So we're going in, and then we're coming out with the mission of God to heal our streets. And, uh, of course, I told you this morning I'd show you a few images of our guns and the plows. And it was 10 years ago that we had our first donated gun, uh, an AK-47. And this is... Um, what we've been doing since is taking those guns and we decommission them and we train pastors and block captains, neighborhood leaders, community organizers in how to decommission guns. And uh, we'd love to, you know, come back sometime and do that specifically. But this is a, the first AK-47, first gun that we had, and, um, and this is what it looked like afterwards. The little swords and the plows thing. And then we've been doing it ever since. And we've been getting a lot of images from all over the world of folks that have repurposed weapons. And uh, that's a guitar made out of guns. And uh, that's a, uh, this is actually with the Mennonite Central Committee, I believe, uh, that is in Mozambique. Uh, uh, guns that were used uh, and now are transformed into music instruments. This is in uh, Najaf in Iraq. In Iraq. They, they poured guns into the streets and crushed them with a bulldozer. And they let the kids drive. <laughs> and then this is uh, one of the guns that we did. We found this gun in an abandoned house that we were fixing up. And it just shows you how saturated we are with guns. So we took that gun. And this is one of the first times that I began to realize that what we're doing is not just symbolic. You know, as this mother, uh, Miss Ryan, she's got a picture of her son on her shirt. And she started beating on it. And with every thump of the hammer, she said, this is for my boy. And almost collapsed, you know, and I realized that, that as now we've done this all over the country, that it's a proclamation that things can be made different, but it's also healing the wounds of violence. My friend Sharon Risher, whose mother was killed in Emmanuel AME Church, historic black church in Charleston, right? Her mom, her cousins, her whole family was killed. And she named all nine of them as she was beating on the gun. And then she told me afterwards, I'm holding her. And she, she's now one of my really close friends. But she said, everything I thought about doing to Dylan Roof, I just did it to that gun. <laughs> And I, so we're, it's, it's allowing God to heal the wounds of violence, right? So I think we've got to find creative ways. Not just this one, right? But we've got to find creative ways that we can take our worship into the streets, that we can take our liturgy into the streets, that we can center the people who have been wounded by the injustices and amplify their voices so that people become uncomfortable, right? And so that we, we say, this is not okay. It doesn't have to be this way. These are just a few of the other things that we, that's that same gun that we made that, that we made the the uh, plow out of that day. So, thanks for letting me share our little family photo album. Maybe let's breathe in together because I've I've thrown a lot out there, and uh, we've we've left plenty of time for us to interact. All of this to say, like, what does it look like for us to be the peculiar people of God that, as Romans says, we're not conforming to this world, 
but we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? We're having a new imagination. We're dreaming what would this world look like if God's dream were realized and how can we participate in making it happen. So let's, uh, let's open it up. Just give us a wave and we'll get you a microphone and um, feel free to share a question or briefly, you know, share a, a reflection if you want to, but be as brief as you can so we can hear from a few people. Working in the field of mental health and um, also substance abuse and serving, I'm sure we, we do a lot down in your community as well. But um, I guess my, what I see as a real obstacle and where I think the church can really be helpful is um, re-entry programs in the communities because they, a lot of um, patients and clients of ours come out of prison or out of um, a recovery environment and um, don't have necessarily the life skills and the support. And so to that end, I would ask, what, what have you strategized and come up with in, in your mission work? Yeah, thanks for your question. And first of all, we're, we are collaborators, right? We're not trying to start a bunch of new ministries, but we're trying to find out where is reentry happening? You know, who's already helping folks that are returning from incarceration to find jobs or get stabilized and how can we build a community around them so we team up with everybody I don't know what those groups are here I know you know the groups in Philly that we work with but I think that's a question that, that all of us could be asking is sort of how can we go alongside the groups that are already there and how can our church communities uh, build bridges with the organizations that are already out there and, and you know I'm sure some of that's happening but um, uh, that that's one of the things that I think we can do, especially groups that have been doing work inside the prisons or reentry work for a long time, um, we don't need to kind of reinvent things. So let's join them, let's support them, and let's figure out how we can just put more wind in their sail. So, yeah. 35 years ago, I was... 35 years ago, I was the missions pastor at a church in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And we had Tony come and speak. And so we decided to take a group of 25 to Kensington. I got lost going to Kensington. And so I stopped a policeman. And I said, here's where I want to go. He said, you don't want to go there. And we took our kids down there. And out of those 18 kids, they went back every summer. Five of them were in full-time ministry today. Three of them moved into center of Philadelphia. They're now involved with the inner city ministry in Philadelphia. I think in the suburbs, we need to get a glimpse of, of the city. And the city is all around the world. The cities are changing. And they're a hotbed. And they need Christ. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thanks for sharing. Could you talk about your community and tell us exactly a little more about what it is? In other words, is it an intentional community? If so, how many people are there? How do you support yourselves? All those kind of just basic questions about how you function. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Well, so we started as an intentional community. Uh, half a dozen of my college friends and I, we pulled our money together. We bought a little row house, that first house that has the prayer on the door, and uh started living together, and, you know, we knew that we weren't inventing everything uh, ourselves. In fact, one of the first groups were the nuns that we got to know, and it was great. They were, they were like, we love what's happening, you know, like uh, some of us have been doing community for a while. Uh, we've been doing community for about 1,600 years, so if you ever want to, you know, share ideas, so that's, you know, immediately we had friends like that. And so now, I mean, we've had community start up, you know, all over. We've got a whole network of community of communities. Um, and our particular community has turned into a little bit more of a village, more of a co-housing thing. So I, I sometimes say we started as an intentional community house, and we ended up with a village. And we, we own, you know, about a dozen properties in the same block. Um, and 
a lot of our community is now uh, led by people who have lived there longer than me. And the language that we, we use, which has been helpful, comes from Dr. John Perkins, who's a 90-year-old uh, mentor of mine. I've got a lot of 90-year-olds in my life. I think we need some uh, uh, elderly wisdom. And so one of the things he says is restoring a neighborhood takes three groups of people working together, remainers, returners, and relocators. And uh, he fleshes that out a little bit, saying remainers are the indigenous long-term neighbors, folks like my block captain, Miguel Diaz, who's been there longer than me. Um, and re returners are folks that maybe grew up uh, in Kensington, and they don't want to forget where they came from, so they go off to school, and, or they get you know, uh, trade skills, and they bring them back to the neighborhood. So that's the returners. And we do a scholarship every year of a young person from our neighborhood. Um, and then there's uh, relocators, folks like me that are not indigenous or long-term from our neighborhood, but we move in. That helps give language. I think that's helpful to see that we're all a part of this community together. And the folks that are relocating need to come in with the right posture of humility to listen and learn, not come in with, you know, thinking that they have the answers. Um, but we all have a piece of the puzzle, and we're all working together. So that's kind of what it looks like. It's, it's a little less like an intentional community in the sense of um, some of the Catholic workers and stuff. It's a little bit broader sweep in the neighborhood. Um, but there still are community houses that we're connected to all over Philly. You asked about the financial part of that as well. Yeah, so we've always pulled our money together. I'm doing a Sunday school in the morning on uh, economics, so uh, I'll go into a little bit more depth. But, you know, I mean, the, the, one of the things that we found is rather than asking how do we accumulate more, we can ask the question from the opposite side, how do we live off of less? And so living in community allowed us to live off of very little resources, part-time jobs that freed us. That we, all, we all had part-time jobs when we started the community so that we could be very present, full, you know, volunteering, working in the neighborhood. Um, and then um, we still have ways that we generate shared money together. So we have like an emergency common fund that we started. Uh, where we give 10% of our income as individuals or as families into an emergency fund, and 100% of that money goes to meet needs in our neighborhood or needs of people that we know. Um, we don't support any organizations. It's all meant to be relationally based giving. So, you know, when my neighbor's car was vandalized, when the corner store was robbed, when things like when things happen, we've sent people to college we've gotten people dentures we paid for funerals all from that emergency fund it's also how we did health care for a while so I won't get in the weeds too much but that's kind of you know there's a lot of ways that we've tried to share money together yeah we got time for a couple more if anybody else has a thought or question thank you very much the pictures were great uh, gave us a sense of um, what you're doing the work is great but I'm wondering, would you describe the community as a community of faith, a community practicing faith? How diverse are the faiths? We have Christians, Jews, Islam, Hindus. I mean, how diverse is the population there religiously? Yeah, so I found it helpful to think of community uh, a little bit more dynamic than who's in and who's out. So we, we found it helpful to think of community in terms of an onion um, because onions have layers. And we sometimes joke that the outer layers get a little bit flaky, so you want to like keep leaning in to the center. Um, but even in Jesus's, in, in the gospel, right, we see layers of community. You have the core disciples. You've got, you know, other folks that are kind of leaning in. You've got... Um, those layers of community. So that's been really helpful. And then someone else told me that he was a rancher, and he said there's two ways to keep cows in. And one of them is by building fences and gates, and the other is by having a really good food source. And if you have a really good food source, you don't have to be obsessed with as much with the gates and the fences. Now, having said that, like I think you know Jesus is at the center of our community and unashamedly has always been. Um, but we have a lot of folks that don't share that faith that are volunteers, that are a part of our, that live on the block and we're doing life together. When someone gets killed, we're 
praying in every way that we know how and we're organizing together. And so I really love, you know, that part of the gospel where the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, um, there's a guy down the streets doing miracles and prophecies, but he's not one of us. And, uh, and uh, should we tell him to stop? And Jesus says, no, you know, if he's not against us, he's for us. So we're always looking for the folks that are, we're, we're running after the same things. And regardless of whether or not they share our faith, we want to work together with them. Uh, we have a statement of faith. We, we, I, I think that, um, you know, being, I know where we found hope. I'm, I'm, I'm an evangelical in my heart. I, I want everyone to know the love and grace of Jesus. And I want to share that with my words. I want to share it with my actions. Uh, but I also know that one of the biggest obstacles to Christ has been Christians who have a whole lot of words, but we don't have as much actions and love. And so I think that's where we're also trying to correct some of that. And so sometimes I find myself having more in common with my Muslim neighbors than I do with my fellow evangelicals. Um, and so to me, it's really about staying centered around Jesus and those values that I hold dear and finding anyone else that I can collaborate with, whether they're Christian or not. That you um, speak out against the death sentence and capital punishment. Um, and would like to know more about what you're doing in the end of June and how to get involved with that. And just was very um, saddened by the fact that, um, and I'll just name names, um, not to be political, but yes, to be political, that we did not in the United States have any executions for 17 years. And then right before Trump left, he authorized 11. So he broke a 17-year silence of our government not executing people by choosing to do it to 11 very rapidly, and we didn't even have enough supplies to do it the way that we had to. We had to come up with some new ones. So I'd like to have you speak more to that, because I'm also in a fractured family who have religious ideology very different than mine, and it's hard to even have conversations of dialogue, and so we choose to t not talk about things because it's so broken in our common faith of growing up right here in Lancaster, and common faith of being Mennonites, and common faith of that we've arrived at very different places in 2022, and I'm broken, I'm broken. Yeah. So I just name it. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Um, so there was a lot there's a lot that you shared, and I, I'm grateful for the tears that you shared it with. And um, just a, a couple of thoughts are, um, I think proximity makes all the difference in the world uh, on so many of these issues. Uh, Mother, Mother Teresa said, it, it can be very fashionable to talk about the poor, but not as fashionable to talk to them. <laughs> you know? And I think whether it's immigration or the death penalty or gun violence, we talk about issues but we don't always center the people that we're talking about. And that's why for me, I mean, what changed my heart was the proximity. I mean, what put a fire in my bones was knowing folks like my friend Derek that were wrongfully convicted or folks like my Billy Neil Moore, who's someone I write about, who committed a murder. And the, the victim's family were Christians. And they, they opposed the death penalty and showed him mercy and love and grace, and he became a Christian, and now he's a pastor, and he's out of prison now. And so I think at the heart of the death penalty is a really, really important question. Do we believe anyone is beyond redemption? And I think that's why it's a spiritual crisis. So I like to talk about it as that. Um, and that's, you know, I've, I've written a lot about that, but like what we're trying to do right now is make that spiritual connection. So, for instance, in my home state of Tennessee, um, half, more than half of the men on death row in Tennessee have asked the governor to come pray with them and hear the story of what Jesus has done in their lives. So that is our request of the governor, Billy, in Tennessee. Um, they've also painted the Stations of the Cross, which I know... There's, you know, that's not exactly a Mennonite thing, but or a brethren thing, but like the the traditional stations of the cross, you know, they show the stages of Jesus's execution, 
And now we have those images that have been used hundreds of years and, you know, different streams of Christian faith. And um, the guys on death row painted those and we're making them available. So they're pretty different, you know. It's a pretty deep way to journey into Easter and Lent and, and this season by looking at the images. So you'll see those on our website. We're going to have those stations in Tennessee on Easter Sunday because there's an execution scheduled right after. And so if you want to join us in Tennessee, you can or you can join online. But we'll be, having, we'll be walking from death row where the guys have made the request to, for the governor to visit them nine miles to the governor's office and then we'll have a memorial uh, uh, an easter service but we'll also be connecting the gospel and the resurrection and the empty tomb to the imminent execution we'll also be in texas if melissa lucio's execution goes forward another case uh, one of the clear cases of wrongful conviction her two-year-old child was pushed down the steps by one of the older children and died tragically and she was convicted of murder wrongfully and is now facing execution next month. So we're working to mobilize around that. And I'm thankful that I just posted this on socials. The Texas House of Representatives uh, has a majority now, bipartisan majority, asking for the stop of her execution. So I, I hope that you'll see these not just as one more issue, but um, we can, you know, when we do our vigils, their families on the call. We've even had folks that are getting ready to get executed that have called us from the death house and we're able to be the last voice that they've heard, you know, praying with them and sh sharing with them. So this is not theoretical, but these are real practical ways you can be involved. Um, and in June, again, at death penalty action, you'll see all the details of the fast and vigil. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, I, I would love for y'all to stay in touch with everything that we're doing. I'm real active on social media, and you can see a lot of the other ways you can get involved at redletterchristians.org. And if there's something that caught your attention, you know, maybe it's the housing or the recovery community or the guns to plows, just come talk to me afterwards. I'll hang out here, and I'll be here, you know, tomorrow as well on Sunday school and worship. And um, to me, these are not about a moment, you know, but it's about what's born, kind of the seeds that are sown. And we're all doing that together. You know, I get inspired when I come places, but then sometimes I'll go home and my wife will say, how was it? I have a sort of smart aleck answer now. I say, I don't know. Ask me in six months. <laughs> you know, ask me in a year. Because I think the, the real thing that we're doing here is not just about today, right? But it's about what we can be doing um, as we move out of this space to be a more faithful witness of God's love and redemption and grace. And it's just a, a pure honor to be able to be a part of the weekend with you. So thank you. We want to thank Shane, and uh, we look forward to hearing what he has to say tomorrow. And again, if you can't be with us tomorrow, that will be uh, on YouTube, and you can check out those presentations there. A few people were asking me how many were here today. Uh, the, we're, we're, we, we're going with 151. It was a little bit of coming and going here and there, but 151, that's our story, and we're sticking to it. So, so that's uh, what our attendance was today. Uh, Finally, I understand many of you have places to go, things to do, and uh, please feel free to do that. If there are a few of you could hang around and help take down some tables, we wouldn't uh, turn away your help as well. Uh, so thank you for coming, and uh, good to see all of you. Thanks. Oh, yeah, chairs stay in place. Yeah. <laughs>